This program was paid for by the friends and partners of Bruce Downs Catholic Ministries. Well, hello, everybody. It's wonderful to have you with us. I pray wherever you are that you know that God is with you exactly in the place where you are. Well, what's a Christian? What is someone who has Christ in their life? What's someone like who doesn't have Christ in their life? What is an impactor? That's someone that's from here who loves God, someone who's watching, who loves God and wants to have an influence in the world. Well, I'm going to answer those questions and I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at what we talked about last time. And I'm just going to summarise, first of all, what we talked about last time and then we're going to build on that. And if you didn't see it, you don't have to worry because I'm going to cover it right now. Many people have different sorts of relationships with God. The very first person we want to talk about is that person where if that black circle represents uh, a person's life and those coloured shapes represent areas of their life like their work or family or interests or their passions, what they're about. Many people in the very centre of their life, they have their ego and then all these other things are in their life. For some people, God is right, out, right outside of their life. The second sort of person is that person where God is part of their life. It's one of the areas, one of the things in their life. They might be someone who goes to church often. Maybe they don't go to church to, uh, that much, but they're aware of God. They believe in God. The third sort of person is where I thought this was the goal. I thought this was the goal. And this is the person who says, I want to place Jesus, I want to put God at the centre of my life and every other area of my life is, is in submission to that. And many people would say, well, isn't that right? Isn't that exactly what being a Christian is about? And for a long, long time, I would have said, well, yes, it is. But what I realised is that I was selling myself very, very, very short on what we are invited to and what we are called to be as a Christian, that there's one other level, there's one other level that once you get to this place of commitment, and it's this, and this other level of commitment is, is to be uh, in this place where we grow in love and intimacy with God. That God is in our life, he's the centre of our life, but that we have a growing relationship with God. Rosemary and I, we just celebrated uh, an anniversary and uh, we've been married for quite a while. And on the face of it, uh, when we got married on that particular day all those years ago, Rosemary and I stood, looked at each other and what we said to each other was, I choose you. I choose you exclusively over everybody else. I'm choosing you exclusively over everybody else. Um, and the scriptures tell us that the image that there is of the Bible is that the two become one. The two become one. And I remember on my wedding day thinking, uh, we'll be one one day, whatever the oneness was all about. One in, one in heart, one in mind, one in the things we wanted, one of the things we did, that that will come. Um, and, and, and that your needs, Rosemary, will be met by me. And that I will put you before me. And I'll put my, before me. As a matter of fact, I'll lay my life down for you. And, and being young and uh, when I got married and, and looking at others who'd been in committed relationships for a long time and over time, often you saw this sense of oneness in, in people. Uh, they often thought the same. They often, before they even, even had to say something to each other, they knew what each other were thinking. They, they were aware of each other. Uh, often they wanted similar things. Uh, they agreed on how things were done. And I remember thinking when I got married, one day we'll be like that too. Well, that's what I thought. Um, and I now look back on my wedding day and I think to myself, how naive and immature was I? Now, I couldn't have known any better, but I didn't realise what it would take and how long a journey that would be. Uh, because for Rosemary and I, our challenges together started the very next day. Well, as a matter of fact, it started the next morning when we walked into the bathroom to clean our teeth. You see, for me, this is a tube of toothpaste. When I, my father, my father, when we were raised, I come from a family of five boys, my father used to say this. 
He used to say, sons, you know, he used to call a son. He said, son, when you're using a tube of toothpaste, you push it from the bottom. And then by the time you've got to the top, it's empty and it's done. Well, for some reason, Rosemary was not like that. This was Rosemary. This was our toothpaste this morning. And we've been married all these years and Rosemary still doesn't do it the right way. That's if you believe that my way is the right way. Because when I talked to Rosemary and I said to Rosemary, that's not the way you've done it. Even though you're 22 years of age, this is not right. There is something fundamentally wrong with this. This is the right way. This is the right way to do it. Well, she just disagreed. I don't know what was wrong with her, but she has never agreed. When it comes to toothpaste etiquette, she has always been, well, she just doesn't have it like, well, I have it. Look at my toothpaste, look at her toothpaste. She tells me this works perfectly just as well. She tells me her teeth are still clean. And more than that, she tells me she, it, it's not as stressful in the morning that's got to be done in a certain way. She just goes there and she presses it in the middle. And I, and I remember when we, in those early times, I was thinking, would I argue about this to the point of pointing out to her just how wrong she was? Because I, you'd all agree that there's something wrong with this, isn't there? I mean, this does appear far more right, doesn't it? You know, I, I, I had to make a decision. Would I try and argue the point with her to win and to correct her because, well, I'm right? Would I make a decision to accept her for who she was and be happy and be happy with her living her life like this and be ha actually happy with it? Or would I grudgingly allow Rosemary to have her way because I wanted peace? Uh, you know, because I wanted peace. To do it her way, but to be honest with you, I was just completely unhappy with it. See, right from the very beginning, if Rosemary and I were going to be one, then something had to happen between here and here. And it happened straight away. And whereas I come along and think about, well, we're going to have a relationship of oneness. We're going to have this relationship where we're unified and, 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 we, and we do it all together. Um, I had to make some decisions that would take a long time because I would need to change. You see, we were married. There was no doubt about that. We were committed to each other. There was no doubt about that. But this whole idea of becoming one, this whole idea of being one, um, and we had to make a decision, would we allow our relationship to be destroyed would we allow our relationship to stay together but be unhappy because we were committed? Or would the two of us work at what it would mean to be one? Um, would we allow our relationship to grow in love and, and in intimacy where we truly knew each other? Where we truly knew each other. Now let's go back to those four diagrams on the screen. Let's go back to those four diagrams. Have a look at the last diagram, the fourth one. See, I stopped at number three. I was just all about just being committed. Jesus, the center of my life. But when we read the scriptures, we listen to the teaching of the church. What is very evident is that, is very evident, is that we're meant to grow to be like Christ, to be in Christ, um, to be in Christ. Have a look at this. Why did God create us? Have a look at this in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. And then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and all of the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. In other words, we were made in the image of God. And, and or another way of saying this is right now on earth, if we think about image, there are seven billion or so images of God walking on the earth right now. Because seven billion of us are made in the image and the likeness of God. Seven billion of us are made in the image and likeness of God. We're images of him. 
But we were made by God. Why were we made by God? We were made by God to know God, to love God, to be in relationship with God, to grow in maturity with God, to be intimate with God. That God was not just meant to be the centre of my life, as in I've made a commitment, he's there. And that's it, I'm committed, I've, I've made the commitment. But rather that I'm meant to grow in this deeper and deeper relationship with God. I've met so many people who, who have no concept or idea about growing in relationship with God. What they have is what I was for so long, someone who is just taught, you go to church and therefore you obey the rules. And that religion, that God is all about rule keeping. And if you keep those rules, God will be happy, you'll pass the test, you'll get to heaven one day, and for me, I'll be a good boy. But that's not what it's all about. That is so far short of what God created us to be and wants for us. Have a look at this in the book of Isaiah. Um, it says, O oh Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, and we are the work of your hand again. O oh Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, and we are the work of your hand. Now think about it, what is clay? Clay is just this dirt. It's just this dirt that you find, in effect. It clay, and, and, and what it is, is it doesn't have the ability to make itself into anything. It doesn't have decision-making power. It doesn't have the ability to go over there or go over there or go over there. It doesn't have the ability to, as I say, shape it. What, who, who has the ability to shape it into something is the potter, the potter. Now, when we went back into the olden times, the olden times, clay was what they made plates and cups out of. And so the potters, the people who made them, as the utensils that were used in all kinds of things, is they determined what any piece of clay would be. And so in the mind of the potter, in the mind of the potter, was what they envisioned, what they thought it would be, what its usefulness would be. It was all in the mind of the potter. Now let's go back and look at that scripture again. Look at the scripture again. O oh Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, we are all the work of your hand. We are the work of your hand. In other words, who God determined you to be, and you to be, and you to be, God has determined. And at, at the individual letter, level of who we are individually, but also at the level of who we are as human beings, that we're made by God to be in this relationship with God, to be in relationship with God, to be like God, to be in the image of God. And so to become like God is a little bit like Rosemary and I growing into oneness. There's a whole pile of work that's involved in, in, in doing that. See, hum, human beings, see, human beings have a willfulness, willfulness in them. St. Paul calls it the flesh, where we do what we want to go and do. Well, we, we, we act in the way that we want to go and act. Where, there, where there's this self-centeredness in us, where what we want is what we want. We want. And, and, and another word for that that, that gets used is, is ego. Ego is, what, what's ego? Ego is our way of living. Ego is our way of living. It's our desire for self-interest. It's our worries, it's our stresses, it's our fears, it's our wants, uh, it's the things that make us, well, happy and satisfied. Ego will always put us as centre. And you can stop and say, well, my ego is pretty good, I'm, I'm not that selfish. But if you run through these questions, you might find, well, your ego really is that dominant. And when I started to say, well, Jesus is at the centre of my life, I commit my life to God. What I was really saying to Jesus at that point in time is, Jesus, you come and you can, you can rent space in me alongside my ego and the two of you can live there. The flesh 
and the Spirit. They clash. That you, both of you can live. You, both of you can live within me. And so you might stop and say, "Well, well, no. Jesus is the Lord of my life. Jesus is the center of my life. God is the most important thing to me." But 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 ego. Well, what's ego? Ego gets offended by others by what someone says about us. Ego is competitive that we might miss out. Ego wants to win. See, ego wants to win. Ego wants to say to Rosemary, this is right, and this, well, this is clearly wrong, right? Ego wants to be right. It wants to be superior. Ego wants more. Ego finds its identity in what we achieve, how we look, who we are with, the things we have. And yet to be a true follower of Christ is to seek his kingdom to be a fruit, true follower of Christ is to say, God, what do you want for me? As I read the scriptures, God, am I living according to your word? Am I living according to the wisdom and the teaching of the church? Right? And to be a Christ follower is to, be the, to seek the kingdom first. It's to grow in a relationship. Now, John the Baptist said this. He said, he said, he must increase, but I must decrease. Leave that on the screen for a second. Well, often when we think about this passage with these words, well, you know, that, that he must increase and I must decrease, we often, I, I, I always used to think of that in terms of, well, Jesus has arrived now. He's now coming to preach and everything else like that. So I should just fade away into the background and just disappear. But I wonder if John the Baptist realised something more. I wonder if John the Baptist realised that his very life, his very ego, his very self-interest needed to decrease in order that Jesus could increase in him. That he, he needed to decrease within himself in order that Jesus could increase within him. See, what I'm talking about right now is spirituality. What I'm talking about now is growing in our spiritual life where we have to say, Lord, not my will, your will be done. Not what the way I think things should be, but your will. I want what you want. Now, the difficulty about saying to God, I want what you want, is that the process of saying no to self and changing to be like Jesus is just simply not easy. It's not. It, 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 it hasn't, after all these decades, it's still not easy, as silly an example as this is, to go into the bathroom and go, well, I'm right and Rosemary's, and this is just little. Any of us who've been married for a while, there are so many things bigger than that that we know that we've got to change in order for us to become one. And so it is in the spiritual life, in our relationship with God. How do we decrease in order that he can increase? How do we decrease? Uh, could it be, if we think about that phrase we've often heard in the Bible, could it be that we have to learn to die to what we want in order that he can live more in us? Have a look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and it says, And all of us, with our unveiled faces seeing the glory of the Lord as through reflected in a mirror are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord the Spirit. What, what, this, what Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, was saying is we get changed. We change over time walking with God. That it's not instant. And whilst we can drive the image of being married too long, too far, Rosemary and I have had so much changing to keep going through. And even after all these decades of being married, we're still working at becoming one. I, I have shared often about the priest who shared faith with me way back 50 years ago when I was just a little teenage boy. And, and he says to me, he's now nearly 90 years old. He says to me, he says to me, I, 
I thought I used to know and I realized and I used to have Jesus in my life, but there's so much more, Bruce, that I have not been changed yet by Jesus. There's so much more of my life that Jesus wants to be in my life and that I just still, still am self-centered on me. Wow. So much. We read the lives of holy men and women through history. And we realize that those holy men and women through history are on a journey of transformation, of becoming like Christ, of becoming like Christ. Um, see, so, so growing in intimacy, growing in love, if we go back to that drawing of the four, of the four circles, you look at that very, uh, that very fourth one of growing in love and intimacy, and underneath that is the cross, which is love. Well, the love of Jesus that saved us, the love of Jesus that seeks to be at the center of our life, to be an intimate, powerful, personal relationship is what God is about. And it's a lifelong journey. So how are we transformed into Christ? How are we transformed into Christ? Here's some thoughts of, of what, what I've learned and what I've seen people far more mature in their walk with God uh, have learned as well. It's a commitment to go beyond just commitment to maturity in your relationship with God. To, to, to be transformed uh, into Christ, it's a commitment to go from just being committed. It's a commitment to go from I believe to go beyond. It's like the commitment of we got married we're committed and now it's a commitment to grow that commitment in our marriage it's the same in our relationship with God I'm it's not just enough that I believe it's not just enough that I turn up to church it's a commitment to grow in a personal deeper relationship with God where I hear his voice I sense his direction I know what he's asking of me and I'm changing peace by piece by piece. Secondly, how are we transformed into Christ? It's a commitment to growing in the love of God and knowing God. It's a commitment to growing in the love of God and knowing God. When I think about Rosemary, one of the things that just always astounds me when I, when I have seen her is, it, it, through the years, is uh, this will come as a shock to many of you. I'm a difficult person to love at times. I'm a difficult person to love for a whole variety of reasons. And yet Rosemary has always had a love that's been over, able to overcome the difficulty of what it is to love me. And when we think about God, God's love far exceeds Rosemary's love. Her love God's love was such that he sent his son into the world for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so it, it, it is to know love, to grow in love. It is, it, is, it is that relationship where I say I'm going to fall deeper and deeper and deeper into the bottomless pit of love. It's, it's what some of us who don't have relationships of great depth dream about when we watch romantic movies, that it would be that we could go deeper and deeper and deeper. I've, I, when I've been speaking at various events, I've sometimes talked about my wedding day. And on that day, I said to Rosemary, uh, in effect, I'm going to love you with my whole heart. I'm going to put you first before me for the rest of my life. And I'm going to give up what I want in order that you can have what you want and what you need. You need. I'm going to give my life to you. I've said almost those exact words. And people have come up to, to me afterwards and say, we never said that when we got married. We walked down an aisle and said, I choose you. I choose you. We never made a decision for love. We just made a decision for passion. We never made a decision that it could go more. We just made a decision to be together because we were attracted to each other. And, and it is the same with God. God seeks a deeper relationship with us, more love from us. There's so much more we could say about that. 
The third thing I've learned about how we're transformed into Christ, it is the desire to be who God made us to be. His sons and his daughter in full and right relationship with him. It is the desire to be. Now you'll see in the previous two comments I made, it is a commitment. It is, a, it is I will do this. But sometimes desire is, this is what I want to do, but I know what I'm like. Desire is saying at my deepest level, this is what I truly want. I'm just not going to live this out of commitment. This is what I want. This is what I hope to be. But I'm going to need God's grace. I'm going to need God to help me to be that in my life. It's the desire to be who God made us to be, his sons and daughter in full and right relationship with God, with him. It takes a life to learn these. How we transform to Christ? Next, it's the decision to begin to act as you want your relationship with God to be. God is before it is there. It's the decision to begin to act as you want your relationship with God is before it is there. It's a decision, it's the decision to be what you want your relationship with God is and to begin to act like that even before you are that. For example, if we look at an athlete, uh, athletes, I've talked to some athletes, they say we start training, we know what we want to be, but we're going to have to train and train and train and then we become. And one of the things that I've learned is that sometimes you've got to begin to act in the direction of what you want to be before you are it. It's a decision to begin to act as you want your relationship with God to be, even before you're there. It is to act in that direction. It is, it is, it is to realise that in the end of the day, <laughs> this doesn't matter. It's a decision, despite maybe frustration, or my family of origin's way of always doing it, that this is okay. And that to begin to be able to smile, to laugh um, with Rosemary about it and to accept her along the way. And, and to be honest with you, I, I didn't start in that place. At, in the beginning, I was intent on changing Rosemary. And as you can see, I haven't done too well there. And, 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 and I had to realise that I had to allow my disapproval, because that's what it was, my sense that I was better to decline and begin to act as I wanted to, where now it doesn't give me a rise at all. If anything, in our family, it is something that's actually funny in the best of ways. But you have to begin to act in that way before you get there. Uh, uh, I've also learned if you're going to be transformed into Christ, it's a decision to persevere. Holding on to vision. Holding on to the vision of the relationship I can have with God. It's holding on to the vision of the relationship I can have with God. Uh, I, I have a number of people that I, I just really admire in terms of their relationship with God. And, and I look at them in the years that they have spent. And as I said recently, you know, when I was 30 years old, I would have said to you, oh, I'm very committed in my faith. And then I got to be 40 years old and went, gee, I wasn't very committed when I was 30, but now I'm 40, now I'm committed. And then when I got to be 50, I thought, oh, when I was 40, I wasn't all that committed, and so it goes on. And I've become more and more fascinated by this thought. What's going to happen in years to come as I grow in greater depth with God? Um, but I have to persevere. I have to keep paying the price of what a good relationship is with God, and for that matter, with anybody else. I have to persevere. And so that means I have to continue to say no to myself at times and keep saying yes to what the relationship I want to have with God. Uh, and uh, I've also learned that uh, if we're going to be transformed into Christ, it's a decision to live a life where repentance is required, starting over and over. Repentance simply means to start again. We often think that repentance means feeling bad. As I say, and I say this often, it doesn't. Repentance means I'm going to start over. It's coming to God and saying, God, forgive me. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. God, I haven't put the effort into our relationship that I have. I've fallen back on just being committed. I just turn up. I'm conscious I need to be a good person, so I'm trying to be a good person. 
but I'm not developing our relationship. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not doing what good relationship demands. And, and, and so you, it's always starting again, just starting over and over and over. If I had one dollar, just one dollar, if I had 10 cents for every time I have started again, I think I would have a huge amount of money throughout the decades of my life of trying to follow God. And finally, uh, how we transformed into Christ, it's living a life filled with joy, knowing who you are becoming. Again, it is living a life filled with joy, knowing who you are becoming. See, see it, is, it is to live with victory. It is to live knowing that I'm walking in the direction of where God wants me to be. And if I will pay the requirement of what good relationship is, what love demands and intimacy demands with God, I will grow in relationship with God. I will have quality relationship with God. I will be made more and more and more into Him. Because as, as we can see in this picture, it's the potter's hands. It's God who we seek to be like. And it's Him who forms us. And if we would allow to lay our lives down to be molded by God into what He chooses us to be, you can't help but be happy with that. Because one day you will get to heaven and you will see God in all of His glory. And every price that we paid, every sacrifice that we gave, every time we made a decision for change, every time we made a decision for love, we will be able to say, I am who you formed me to be. I am in love with you. I have a relationship of intimacy with you because you formed me and I let you form me and you have changed my heart and my eternity. Loving God, I just thank you today that you are with us. And Lord God, I thank you that you are the potter, that we are the clay. I thank you that you do call us beyond commitment into love and into intimacy. Help us, Lord, to walk in your way, to be who you call us to be. And Father, we make this prayer in the name of Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I've really always loved this image of God being the potter and we being the clay. And that verse from Isaiah 64 verse 8 that says this, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, and we are all the work of your hand. I just think that's such a fabulous passage of Scripture. And, and uh, teaching people, helping people to come to understand who God is, to come to understand what God wants to do in our life is really what this ministry is all about. It's, it's about helping people come to that deeper knowledge of God and then living that in their life. Well, I wanna ask you today whether you will stand with me, whether you will help me proclaim the gospel around the world and bring that power of being who God calls us to be into people's lives. To be honest with you, I can't do this without you. We reach so many people in so many places through the media, through, uh, through online, through television, and many people watch and many of them are touched by having heard the gospel at a time that is important to them and that seems to really speak into their life. The only way we can do that is because so many of you have helped us share Christ because you believe in it. And so I wanna ask you today, would you help me? Would you help me share Christ and change people's lives? I wanna say thank you in particular to our Faith Builder partners, all of those people who've been into our website, and have signed up to give on a regular basis so that we can count on you, so that we know that we can step out and go further to all the places that God is calling us to go. I'm traveling across the United States at this time. And as you, and, and as I'm close to many of you, I know I'll see many of you who are there. And I pray that this is a great blessing to you uh, in your life. But you, so many of you make that possible for us to go to the places we do. And also to many people who give from time to time. I wanna thank you for standing with us in faith. You can go to this address on the screen or you can go to the Give tab. And my prayer is that our hearts would be moulded by God into who He calls us to be. As I say, I seriously can't do this 
without you. And together, we change the world. As a sign of my, as a gift to you, just to say thank you to you, I wanna send you an ebook that I've written called Seven Life-Changing Habits We Can Learn from Mary. Seven life-changing habits we can learn from Mary. Mary was some, certainly someone who said, Lord, I'm just clay in your hands. Do to me as you want. And my prayer is that, that you, you would be blessed by this. And I really give it to you by way of thanks to say thank you for helping me share Christ. Why don't we pray? Loving Father, I thank you today that you love us. I thank you today that you are with us. And I thank you today that you help You help, Lord God, us become who we are. You don't leave us alone, that you give us strength and courage and grace to respond. You form us. Thank you for being with us, Lord. I thank you for every person that's helping share Christ around the world. And Father, we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, thank you for being with us. I pray when I'm traveling in the United States, if you happen to be at one of these locations, if you wanna come and join me for a time of prayer and reflection, uh, I'd love to be able to see you. Um, And uh, to people from lots of other places, we'll be there in time. Hey, God bless you. See you next time. And don't forget, wherever you are, God is never far from you. This program was paid for by the friends and partners of Bruce Downs Catholic Ministries.